Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank everyone at DDI for the opportunity to present today. Um, let's see. Mm -hmm. There we go. Um, I'm very excited to present to this audience because the way the OSCO protocol is designed is that it's tailored to each individual. It's very data centric because my background is research. And so I rely very heavily on a number of tests and test data followed by targeted supplementation and then repeat testing to evaluate the efficacy of what we've added. I donate my time to write suggestions on tests and then ask that each individual work with their own doctor to implement the program and to make final decisions on, on supplements and supplement choices. The program is centered around the methylation cycle and this is uh, the methylation cycle that I utilize. <clears throat> Many of you are familiar with the methionine and folate portions of the pathway, but may not recognize the inclusion of the part of the pathway that utilizes BH4 for dopamine and serotonin generation, as well as the urea cycle, and then tangential we can connect to the Krebs energy cycle. And so I look at all aspects of this as well as individual test data and SNPs and mutations in this pathway um, in terms of making suggestions for individuals, doctors to implement. And what, what does the methylation cycle do and why is it so critical? It's involved in everything from repairing and building new DNA and RNA to dealing with inflammation, energy production, uh, involved with cancer, microbes, infectious diseases, digestive issues, modulating uh, DNA, and, and being involved with epigenetics so we can adjust and adapt and bypass mutations in the DNA with, with epigenetics that use methyl groups to um, coordinate with DNA. And so if we don't have the methylation cycle working optimally, the number of uh, imbalances in the body is significant. And so I tend to work primarily with individuals who have complex neurological issues, whether it's autism, MS, Parkinson's, Lou Gehrig's disease, chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, chronic bacterial issues and bowel dysfunction. Um, but we also work with people who are perfectly healthy, just trying to stay balanced to age um, in, in a lovely way. And if we look down here, this illustration is pointing out that we have DNA and then we have methyl groups that are attached to the DNA. And when we have mutations, it causes breaks visually in this diagram in the DNA. And generally, methyl groups that are added via epigenetics can help to compensate. But if we have mutations in this methylation cycle, what can happen is we lose the ability to have epigenetic help to bypass mutations that someone has been born with. And that is part of the reason why having a functional methylation cycle is so critical for health and well-being. And because of this, people panic when they hear that they have even a single mutation in this pathway. And so one that people are very familiar with is the MTHFR SNP. But it's not just about a single imbalance or a single SNP. And I, I like people to take and keep in mind that it's the whole pathway we want to be thinking about. Otherwise, we can make judgment calls using higher doses of single supplements that may make a positive impact on an MTHFR SNP, but could have negative consequences when we keep in mind the entire pathway. And so I look at multifactorial health issues as a way to um, 
unbalance them and get them they're due to a number of things going wrong simultaneously. And so the illustration I often give is to talk about the Titanic. There's a number of factors that needed to go wrong simultaneously in order to have a complex issue. And if you were able to eliminate any one of those factors, you wouldn't have the problem that was created. And it's similar when we talk about complex health issues, that if we can simply eliminate one or two of the factors that add to the problem we're addressing, we can try to get the body back in balance. And the silver lining here is that the methylation cycle is a nutritional pathway. And so we can look at natural supplements to help to bypass and balance the system, evaluate how we're doing in terms of that supplementation by using testing, and then adjust the supplement regime obviously working in conjunction with your own doctor or health professional to customize a program to get each individual back into a better place of health. And so I'll briefly go over some of the other factors to keep in mind and some of the other tests through DDI that one can run that play a role. And then we'll focus more heavily on the toxic and essential metal test and go through case studies in detail, looking at how that plays a role. Um, one of the other pieces we can look at is excess glutamate in the system. And glutamate isn't just from foods and diet. It can occur due to imbalances in the body and due to supplementation with supplements that may increase glutamate levels. Um, it's the first starting point that I utilize and address while we're waiting for results from the hair metal test, which is the first test that I'll run with individuals. And Various sources of GABA or the nerve calm nu nucleotide blend can make a difference when we're trying to get glutamate imbalance. It's important to keep in mind that glutamate and GABA have a seesaw relationship. And so what we want is to try to balance that rather than having glutamate too high, which can cause issues with stims, um, nervous twitches, OCD. And the balance between glutamate and GABA is influenced by the pancreas. And so one of the things we'll look at in a moment on the toxic and essential metal test are minerals that play a role with blood sugar levels and keeping in mind the role of the pancreas in this glutamate and GABA balance. The idea is that some glutamate in your system is fine, but if we start to overflow, that's when we begin to have problems. And glutamate, aspartate, glutamine in some cases, aspartame, aspartic acid are considered excitotoxins, so they can overexcite the nerves to death. And I'll tie this back together with the toxic and essential mineral test when we get to that in a moment. The next piece that I've touched on briefly is nutrigenomics. And while ideally it would be great if everyone ran a nutrigenomic panel so we knew where the mutations in the system were and can look at bypassing them with nutritional support. Um, not everyone has the ability to do that, but we can get there indirectly by looking at the toxic and essential mineral test. At a bare minimum, using a multivitamin that will support the methylation cycle that includes DHA, phosphatidylserine, B12, low-dose lithium, without high doses of any of the nutrients that feed into the cycle, especially if we don't have SNP data. Um, would be a starting point. Um, I have a, a general vitamin I use in my protocol, but I'm sure that, you know, there are other ones out there people can consider. Um, we can use natural products to bypass SNPs if we know um, where the SNPs are and if we've run a nutrigenomic profile. 
DDI does have a nutrigenomic profile that looks at the various SNPs in the methylation cycle. And if possible, and if that can be run, that's ideal because then it's easier to customize the supplement plan and know which type of B12 we want to utilize. Um, microbes are affected by the methylation cycle. Microbes are also affected by certain minerals and microbes can hold on to toxic metals. And I'll illustrate that in a moment. And so one of the next pieces that we wanna to try to look at is which microbes are a problem and also to be sure that we have sufficient normal flora in the system because normal flora plays a role in generating folate intermediates that help to feed into the cycle and, and keep an individual balanced. And so after running a toxic and essential metal test, the next test I often run is a CSA or a GI 360 to look at microbes in the system. Uh, we don't want to overlook the effect of stress on the system. And stress isn't just about emotional stress, it's physical stress. And so when there's inflammation in the body, that will add to stress in the system. And stress will trigger inflammatory mediators that are a problem. And indirectly, we can get at the effect of stress by looking at some of the intermediates on a GI 3 60, um, levels of lactoferrin, lysozyme, what's going on with secretory IgA, if we're seeing blood in the stool, particularly high gut pHs or low gut pHs will play a, play a role with inflammation. And the other thing I like about uh, the CSA and GI 360 is to look at the elastase levels, which is going to give us an indirect indication of what's going on with the pancreas which is so important in terms of that glutamate and GABA balance. Uh, methylation is impacted by stress. And so where we're looking at the methylation cycle, keeping that methylation cycle in balance and having the ability to epigenetically modify imbalances in the system can be a huge help in terms of addressing stress. Um, I will spend the remainder of my time talking about the toxic and essential mineral test and going into detail because I find that is a great starting point for any program. Um, if you can also run nutrigenomics, that's ideal, but if not, at the very least, people should be able to run this test. I like to run it as a baseline test initially adjust supplementation, and then rerun the test again to make sure that what we've added is having the impact we would like. Um, in terms of how often to run a toxic and essential mineral test, bare minimum, I think twice a year. If there are significant imbalances, I would say three or four times a year. Um, you don't want to wait an entire year to find out that everything you've been doing isn't having the desired effect that you would like. One of the first things that you want to think about when you look at essential minerals is the level of lithium. Lithium is important for B12 transport, and B12 sits at the juncture point between the folate and methionine cycles, and it's like gears that need to fit together to function properly, and we want to be sure that the B12 we're adding is transported and that we're not adding high dose B12 in the absence of paying attention to lithium, because if we do that, we may end up depleting lithium if we're not cognizant of its role. Um, if I have time to get to some of the extra slides, there's a number of slides that illustrate the relationship between lithium and B12 levels and B12 transport. I mentioned this one because it's a very recent article highlighting the relationship between lithium and DNA methylation. So the role that lithium plays 
vis-a-vis -vis methylation and B12 levels. While it may seem counterintuitive, I always begin with the essential elements on the bottom half of the page and review the toxic elements second. And I know many people look at the hair metal test and want to be concerned with detox, but I am as concerned with the essential minerals being in balance and making choices of the form of essential mineral that will fit with the needs that we're seeing on, on the lower half of the test. So for instance, in this first case, we've got some lithium dumping. The reason I think it's significant is because all of the other essential minerals are, are in the lower range of normal. And this is the only one, with the exception of a small amount of boron, sitting to the right. And in the absence of lithium support, this suggests lithium dumping. So this would be an example of when you go to add B12, and cobalt will be a measure of B12, that lithium level may drop to an uncomfortable level, and we will see some tests where that happens. And so you want to be paying attention when we're seeing excess lithium being excreted or lithium being excreted in the absence of supplementation. I like to add minerals individually to customize getting balance into the system. It's not to say you can't just add general mineral support, but my preference is to customize it because everyone is unique. And if we have the ability to do that and then follow up with repeat tests to be sure we've accomplished our goals, that I think is more significant. And so to look at individual supplementation, both calcium and magnesium are low. The next thing I look at when I once I see low magnesium is what's happening with potassium. Potassium and rubidium have a relationship. If potassium is depleted, oftentimes rubidium will be depleted and vice versa. There are supplements that support potassium and magnesium at the same time, but because potassium and rubidium are okay on this test, my preference would be CalMag DNK because the DNK will help to transport the calcium. And perhaps once we run a follow-up, we'll add a little extra magnesium because I prefer magnesium higher than calcium. Calcium will work with glutamate to overexcite nerves. The example I often give is that glutamate is the gun and calcium is the bullet. And so we want calcium in normal range, but we don't want calcium higher than magnesium. Copper and zinc, it's a similar situation. I want zinc higher than copper, but I'd rather see both of them to the right of the 50th percentile. When both copper and zinc are low, I will use a zinc-copper combination supplement. And then perhaps once I rerun to make sure zinc is higher than copper, when we do a repeat follow-up test, we may add a little extra zinc. Low dose alpha lipoic acid and albumin can help with zinc and copper transport, but keep in mind alpha lipoic does have a sulfur group, and we want to think about our total sulfur load with respect to molybdenum levels, and we'll discuss that in a moment. Chromium and vanadium play a role in blood sugar. That relates back to the concerns that I mentioned earlier about pancreatic support, when I see lower levels of chromium and vanadium, I have particular supplements I utilize that include both of those minerals, as well as additional pancreatic support. Um, selenium helps with detox, and we'll take a look at that in a moment. I use something called Metal Away that has low doses of selenium, horsetail grass, and EDTA for gentle detox. 
Uh, selenium can be added on its own, but keep in mind that too much selenium is toxic. You need methylation in order to get rid of excess selenium. So if you don't have the methylation cycle in balance, adding high doses of selenium could be a problem. Uh, we want to look at sulfur levels because many of us utilize glutathione, garlic, alpha-lipoic, various sulfur donors to help with pulling mercury from the system. But we need sufficient levels of molybdenum in order to process the sulfur. And many on the program tend to have very high levels of taurine and other sulfur-containing amino acids that also need molybdenum. And so we want to be supportive of sulfur, but not too high. And I find that when zirconium is low, the use of chervil, which is in the parsley family, as well as liver supports will help to get that back in balance. Next, we look at toxic metals. Any level of aluminum is noteworthy to me, particularly because microbes will hold on to aluminum. And so the next step in this case for me is always to run a CSA and if I can, a fecal metal test to look at what microbes are available are in the system that are available to hold on to aluminum and something like selenium, EDTA, horsetail grass, metal away to help with the aluminum. Arsenic is excreted from the system through the help of methylation. So again, as with selenium, we want to be sure methylation is in balance to help to deal with arsenic in the system. When I see uranium, one of the next steps is to run the drinking water analysis test to see if uranium is coming from the water. And in addition to use a antioxidant in the system to try to help with uranium damage. In this second example, we see both calcium and magnesium being excreted to a high level. That level of excretion can lead to depletion over time. In addition, we can see calcium is much higher than magnesium, which is not ideal from a standpoint of the nervous system. Supplements like vimposatin or Prevagen may help to balance the high calcium levels. And if needed with a future follow-up uh, essential mineral test, what we would do is add additional magnesium. Potassium is a normal range, as is rubidium, and so the choice of supplementation for magnesium is, again, CalMag DNK or magnesium citrate or magnesium malate. If potassium and rubidium were low, I would suggest a potassium-magnesium Krebs supplement that would address both. I've mentioned molybdenum a few times. Molybdenum is critical. When individuals have candida in the body, that'll deplete molybdenum because molybdenum is necessary to detoxify the aldehydes um, that are excreted by candida. Those who are ingesting a lot of dairy, the enzyme xanthine oxidase plays a role and molybdenum is a cofactor for addressing that. And um, molybdenum, again, is important for processing sulfur groups. So we want to make sure that molybdenum is supported. Um, molybdenum and B12 work together to deal with excess sulfur. And so something that I have a, a particular supplement I like that utilizes molybdenum and B12 in the combination for that. Strontium is also being excreted at a high level, and oftentimes we see that prior to a drop in lithium. This individual may be someone who has an MTR SNP because oftentimes imbalances in molybdenum and strontium are indications of, of MTR SNPs, and so an MTR supplement can be utilized in those cases. Also, as a next step, I would run a urine amino acid test to make sure that we don't have too many sulfur amino acids that are putting pressure on molybdenum, and a stool test to take a look at microbes, including yeast. Um, again, when we see strontium being excreted, we want to be considering some low-level lithium support. 
I use a multivitamin that has low level lithium and a, a GABA spray that utilizes a low dose of lithium to be sure lithium isn't going to drop with this level of strontium excretion. And moving forward, we want to carefully monitor lithium levels, once, especially once B12 support is in place. Um, Phosphorus is a bit low. One of the supplements we could utilize would be ATP, or depending on what we see in terms of toxic elements, riboflavin 5-phosphate. If potassium were also low, we might want to use a potassium phosphate supplement. And so this highlights why I like to look at the essentials first, so I know what's going on with essentials and can target the supplement of choice or mineral of choice once I get to a set, uh, to toxic elements. Uh, we see aluminum excretion again here for this individual. Next step again, running a CSA to see which microbes may be holding on to aluminum and utilizing a supplement with selenium horsetail EDTA to help to pull the aluminum out of the system. When we see barium excretion, there's a relationship between barium and potassium. And even though potassium was in balance for this individual, seeing this level of barium excretion, I'll go back a moment. What I might consider is a, a potassium phosphate as a supplement so that I'm addressing the need for phosphorus and at the same time addressing the issue with barium excretion. Uh, cadmium has a relationship with zinc, and so we want to be sure that we have zinc well supported. Zinc is a critical mineral for an enormous number of enzymatic reactions in the body. Uh, when we see both nickel and silver or one or the other being excreted, it can have a negative impact on riboflavin 5-phosphate levels, which is a critical intermediate in the mitochondrial pathway. And so that would be a secondary way to be adding phosphate groups, um, adding riboflavin 5-phosphate to help to address the negative impact of nickel and silver, and at the same time support an essential element. In this third case, we again see major excretion of calcium and magnesium, but in this case, as compared with last time, we've got low sodium and potassium, and you'll note that rubidium is also low. So this would be a situation where the the what I would supplement of choice would be a magnesium potassium Krebs intermediate to address both the magnesium as well as the potassium rather than looking at CalMag D and K. And in addition, because calcium is so much higher than magnesium, again, looking at something like Vimpocetin and Prevagen, perhaps ATP and uh, mitochondrial support, a general mitochondrial support to help with mineral transport. And then this would be a case I definitely would want to rerun the hair metal test in three to four months to make sure that the supplementation I was using are allowing for better balance. And that has been my experience that within three to four months, we do see um, uh, positive differences. And so again, highlighting that potassium is quite low, phosphorus is also low. If needed, we could also add potassium phosphate. What I would tend to do is start with magnesium potassium Krebs, rerun a mineral test in three to four months. If potassium is still low, then consider additional potassium phosphate. Uh, selenium is also on the low end. I prefer to use a, a complex that has low dose selenium with other compounds in it because using selenium on its own could drive the levels too high and put more pressure on the methylation cycle. And since we're starting with a hair test and we may not have the methylation cycle in total balance, using high dose selenium could be non-ideal. Um, again, when we see strontium excretion at this level, we want to think of MTR support and carefully monitor lithium levels, especially once we've added B12. 
Um, again, I pay attention to any level of aluminum, and the first thing I do after that would be to suggest a comprehensive stool test in order to look at the microbes in the system. Um, again, we see barium excretion, and so we want to be sure that we're supporting potassium. We can use uh, potassium Krebs, and if we choose at this point potassium phosphate or wait for a follow-up test. Um, lead, we want to run a water test, make sure we're not seeing lead in the water, use some low-dose sources of EDTA, make sure that we've got zinc in the system because lead will interfere with zinc, and zinc is critical, and lead can also interfere with GABA levels, and so we want to make sure we're supporting with GABA. Um, and that we have adequate pancreatic support to allow for the conversion of glutamate to GABA. Um, high level nickel excretion. Nickel can be extremely inflammatory when it's being excreted from the system. I have a number of supplements that I utilize a uh, inflammatory pathway cap and several nucleotide blends to deal with the inflammation created by nickel excretion. Um, and again, riboflavin 5 phosphate to make sure the mitochondrial pathway isn't negatively impacted by the nickel excretion. <clears throat> um, in this next case, we've got low calcium magnesium. Given the age of the individual, if estrogen levels are a problem, if there's any propensity for estrogen-related medical issues, we could consider calcium glucurate and a separate magnesium supplement. If estrogen isn't an issue, then we could certainly consider CalMag D and K, and the vitamin D and vitamin K may be helpful for transporting especially um, because we may want to consider bone support in someone at this point. Uh, chromium and vanadium are low. We want to think about pancreatic support. Look at the level of elastase on a CSA test to see if we need extra pancreatic support. Also, given the age of the individual and that both chromium and vanadium are low, uh, have her doctor check blood sugar, HbA1c, and insulin on a regular basis. And if we are able to run a nutrigenomic test to rule out a BHMT8 homozygous SNF, that would be a good step too. Um, looking at the boron and strontium levels, we may want to consider a bone integrity test as well as bone support. Again, looking at the age of the individual and the, the profile that we're seeing. Iron is low. Um, I have... Concerns about adding high-dose iron directly because iron will increase the virulence of microbes in the system. I prefer to use something like dandelion root or dandelion leaf, uh, lactoferrin to make sure the iron is being transported where we want. And if you are adding higher dose iron directly to please be sure to watch and run a CSA to make sure that we're not creating problems with microbes. <clears throat> and we probably would want to run a CSA in any event, given that we're seeing some aluminum excretion, to take a look at what microbes may be holding on to aluminum. Um, because of arsenic, we want to be making sure that we have methylation in, in balance. Uh, due to the mercury, we want to be thinking about something like glutathione um, as a support to help escort it out of the system. And then we're not seeing a lot of excretion down here, which is an indirect measure of a need for mitochondrial support. We could just directly add ATP, something like mitophore for something like CoQ10, or run an organic acid test to look at intermediates in the Krebs cycle and, and have a more targeted supplementation for mitochondrial support. Also, we're seeing a little bit of excretion down here, but again, the lack of excretion of nickel and silver and titanium would indicate that we want to focus on mitochondrial support. Um, in this next case, both copper and zinc are very low. The rest of the minerals 
look pretty good, could maybe use a little tweaking. Um, I would recommend a zinc copper supplement and also a little bit of alpha lipoic and albumin to help with transport. Um, I prefer zinc levels higher than copper, and so I probably would add additional zinc in addition to the zinc copper supplement, or you could wait for a follow-up uh, hair metal test and do it at that time. But where this is pretty much in balance, if you're going to wait six months, you may want to consider a little extra zinc um, right from the beginning. Uh, chromium and vanadium are a little low, but certainly within normal range. Could look at a supplement for chromium and vanadium, run a CSA and look at elastase levels and look to see if some additional pancreatic support would be indicated. Um, because there's a little excretion of iodine, might want to run a urine iodine test next. Also keep a close eye on lithium, which is in balance here. But oftentimes, if we're excreting iodine, we may also begin to dump lithium. Selenium is low range normal. Depending on what we see with the toxic elements, we may or may not want to look at some additional selenium support. Um, here, when we see a very high level of bismuth excretion, in the absence of bismuth supplementation, as in this case, we want to seriously consider looking for H. pylori. And so I would run a CSA or GI 360 to look at the rest of the microbial environment because helicobacter will uh, cause very large fluxes in pH levels. The pH may initially be very low, and then because of compounds excreted by helicobacter, the pH can climb high. And so we would want to look at a DNA-based test for helicobacter if possible, because helicobacter is very difficult to diagnose otherwise. And in addition, run a CSA or GI 360 to look at the rest of the environment for the gut. Um, in this next case, we're seeing very low potassium and um, rubidium. And so we really want to consider more than one source of potassium support maybe something like potassium phosphate, as well as a potassium magnesium Krebs. Zinc is being excreted, and when we see zinc excretion in the absence of supplementation, that can lead to depletion. Zinc is critical for enzymatic reactions, and particularly if high levels of cadmium are being excreted as a toxic metal, that'll interfere with zinc. We also need zinc to help with sleep, and so if this individual has sleep issues, we may want to run a melatonin test. And so this would be another situation where I would recommend rerunning a hair test in three to four months rather than waiting six months. Molybdenum, molybdenum is low, and I've mentioned already how critical molybdenum is. We may want to run a urine amino acid test to check taurine levels and make sure we are not having an issue with sulfur processing of sulfur amino acids due to lack of molybdenum. Also run a CSA because candida can play a role in terms of uh, uh, depleting molybdenum levels. And when we see low zirconium, we want to think about liver support, a little extra support for liver using um, supplementation. We're seeing a small amount of aluminum excretion for this individual. We were going to run a CSA anyway based on the essential minerals, and so that would be a good next step. Uh, we knew we needed potassium support already based on essentials and because of the barium excretion that highlights the need for potassium support. 
it's not surprising given the level of zinc excretion that cadmium is a problem. You want to rule out that this individual isn't exposed to cigarette smoke in the home. You could run a water test to be sure that that isn't a source of cadmium. And we certainly want to be sure that we're using adequate zinc support. And again, we run a hair test in three to four months to be sure that this is in better balance. <clears throat> There's quite a bit of mercury excretion. We could consider glutathione support, but remember any sulfur donors that we're using to address the mercury can also require molybdenum for processing. And so it again highlights the need for molybdenum support and checking on those levels. Also using various supplements to help to balance inflammation and excitotoxicity in the system, including GABA and certain nucleotide blends that I like to use. And then there's a number of um, herbs and supplements that can be used to help um, with excretion and detox if, if that's desired. Um, again, when we see nickel and silver excretion, we want to consider riboflavin 5-phosphate, mitochondrial support, and support with uh, supplements to help to deal with inflammation. Because as you can see, when the toxic metal representation is high, that's usually an indication that there's inflammation inflammation in the system. And we want to be certain that we've got supplements in place to help the body to deal with inflammation. I think we have a bit of time where I can run through some of the extra slides, but to reiterate, the protocol that I've designed um, is centered around the methylation cycle. It's individually tailored to each person. I donate my time and I am a consultant. The program is designed to work with each individual's healthcare professional to determine which of my suggestions make sense for implementation. The hair element test is a great starting point. If we can also run a nutrigenomic test, that's great. But as I've illustrated through this talk, there's a number of other tests that I recommend. When I make suggestions, I make suggestions not, on, not only on the hair metal test, but I'll suggest what other tests you may want to consider next, what supplements you want to consider, and what the top eight starting supplements might be so that each individual has the information to work with their own doctor to get on a better path to health and wellness. Um, I have a number of learning materials. Um, there's starting materials, a number of seminars, ebooks, and guidebooks. My goal is to share all of my information to give you the tools you need to help all the individuals you're working with. And I believe knowledge is power. The more information we have, the better equipped we are to make a positive difference in terms of helping people with complex health issues. Um, so just to digress, what is methylation? It's simply moving CH3 groups around. And where people are very familiar with the concept of a water molecule, a CH3 group is not that dissimilar. Epigenetics is the term that's applied to the use of methylation to uh, play a role in terms of modifying DNA after the fact. And so epigenetics is the link between nature and nurture. And methylation happens so many times in the system, which is why I believe it's so critical and why there are certain combinations of mutations in the methylation cycle that I never see. And I believe that those mutations may be lethal. Um, if we look at, time for Q&A, okay. Um, if we look at gen, uh, metabolic pathways in the body, you can see how frequently methylation does play a role. Um, so we're ready for Q&A.